I'm pleased to welcome you to this IMF Summer School Course Preview on Financial Development and Financial Inclusion, or FDFIX. In this free online course, you will learn about how financial markets develop and what they need to grow. We will help you build a solid understanding of the various markets and their instruments and show you how they can be used to enhance inclusion. Small and medium enterprise, or SMEs, are vital economy drivers in many regions. We will introduce you to the challenges and risks they face in assessing credit and propose technology to enhance that access. We will address how to overcome similar difficulties that individuals and micro-entrepreneurs face in receiving credit from banks. You will learn how policies and intervention, especially those emphasizing financial education and technologies, can make all the difference in building financial inclusion for household. We'll also look at financial technologies, regulatory challenges, policy option, and so much more. You can register for the full FDFX course at the link below. If you're interested in learning more about how to promote and develop stronger, more inclusive market, I hope you will join us. To understand financial inclusion, let us begin with the entire population, generally taken to be above the age of 15. Out of the population, part of them are already using formal financial services and are therefore included. So who are the excluded population? Among the excluded population, those not using formal financial services, some choose not to do so, either because of cultural or religious reasons or because they feel they have no need for financial services. One significant part of this group comprises those who have access to financial services through a family member and therefore do not need to have their own account. See next unit on remittances. Another reason for voluntary exclusion could be a lack of trust or understanding of financial services. Who are the involuntarily excluded? The main policy arena will be in involuntary exclusion, those individuals and firms that would like to use financial services but cannot. Out of these, some have insufficient income or are of such a high risk that a prudent financial system will exclude them. Among low-income excluded individuals are those who only demand small services, that is, small loans, savings, etc., that do not warrant the fixed costs implicit in financial intermediation. Why is financial inclusion important? Financial inclusion is essential in alleviating poverty and achieving inclusive growth. The benefits go beyond individuals and include firms. New evidence shows that financial inclusion for small and medium type enterprises is associated with innovation and job creation. 60 countries have set formal targets for financial inclusion and two-thirds of regulatory institutions are tasked to enhance financial inclusion. Should a country focus on the development of banks or capital markets? To answer this question, we need to first understand the arguments for each. The argument to focus on bank developments has several reasons. First, banks can make lending decisions based on the relationship which helps increase credit availability to firms and individuals and potentially lower collateral requirement when information is limited. Banks tend to know their customers and community. Second, banks acquire information about firms and can induce better corporate governance. Third, Bank-based systems offer better resharing over time, better than markets, and thereby avoiding short-termism of equity markets. The argument for capital market development has the following reasons. Markets are better at encouraging innovative high-growth projects compared to banks, which tend to have bias toward prudence against high-risk projects. Markets can help put pressure to replace inefficient and incompetent managers, especially when banks' incentives to exercise corporate control are distorted and prevent outsiders from replacing incompetent managers. Markets 
can be more effective gatherers or processors of information in new and certain situation involving innovative products and processes. Markets can also have reduced problems in opaqueness and concentration of ownership faced by bank-based system. Amid the two views, it should be noticed that different participants in the financial systems do not necessarily substitute each other, rather they can complement each other. For example, banks can raise capital in the equity market or tap funding in short-term funding markets, which we will discuss later in the module. Equity markets also allow exit strategies for venture capitalists by listing companies in the stock market, known as initial public offerings. Also, each segment of the financial system overcomes market frictions in different ways. For instance, public capital markets have an advantage in a high information environment and do not need close relationship among parties, while banks have an advantage in relationship-based environment with limited information. On the other hand, some studies suggest that for less developed countries, the development of banking system is more important while the importance of market increases with higher level of income. There are multiple ways in which technology can help promote financial inclusion. The first way is to lessen information asymmetry. Usually borrowers or users of funds know more about their projects or other uses of the funds than anyone else. Indeed, they may try to hide some information from potential lenders or funders, or they may decide to invest in projects much riskier than they said they would. This information asymmetry, borrowers know more than lenders about their investment intentions, is one of the basic reasons for a financial intermediary. Adverse selection and moral hazard are both concepts driven by informational differences. By using algorithms and other pieces of electronic information found through fintech methods, a lot of basic information can be seen more easily by a potential lender, allowing them, whether a bank, a non-bank financial institution, a corporation, or just another person, to better see whether the borrower is likely to use the money they receive for something useful, such as a bona fide investment, or something frivolous, like a vacation or gambling. With greater assurances about the borrower, these data potentially allow the lender to lend more, lend for a longer period of time, or lend at a lower interest rate. Second, technology can be used to speed up transactions. Computers can do things in nanoseconds, whereas people take minutes. This means the same number of transactions can be done at lower cost, making the per transaction costs minimal. This means that more people can be served at the same cost. Next, technology allows for better matching. Computer programs can see the characteristics of borrowers from the information they put into the system and match them to the characteristics that lenders want. For instance, if a borrower wants to borrow for no more than three years and a certain lender also wants to be paid back in that same time frame, the computer can match these two people's loan maturity desires pretty much instantaneously. Moreover, computer programs can match data on multiple dimensions more easily than bank lending officers. Since the timing of these decisions can also be made faster, the entire intermediation process can be shortened and made more precise. Technology also lowers the barriers to entry by lowering fixed costs of operations. After the upfront cost of buying hardware, which is getting cheaper over time, and the cost of programming the components of a transaction are incurred, the ongoing costs of running the system are reduced substantially. Part of this is just a programming feature, but there are elements that suggest different financial networks or platforms, if they're programmed using common languages or features, can also talk to each other, thereby lowering costs through interoperability. For instance, some public payment systems also speak to traditional banks 
and allow payment instructions to flow through to a person's individual bank account. And finally, FinTech can enable greater economies of scope. This is another type of interoperability that operates across diverse types of information systems. Information from, say, a social media platform can be used to better understand a person's financial situation that may allow financial products to be targeted to that individual. In some cases, these social media firms may negotiate with other financial firms to team up to share information or, what is becoming increasingly common, they integrate through mergers or acquisition to form a more seamless system. Financial inclusion is different from financial development. A country can have a well-developed financial system with banks that are efficient, well-managed, and profitable. But these banks may only be interested in working with large corporate clients and the government and ignoring the small businesses and households. Why might this be the case? Why might banks not be interested in small clients? And if that is the case, how can this be changed? These are the questions we turn to now. So in this and the next module, we will explore the financing of the small and medium enterprises, SMEs. We will then look at the financing of households in module six. We will look at the data and see that many SMEs around the world do not have access to finance. To understand why this is the case, we will talk about the unique challenges that SMEs face accessing finance. Finally, we will evaluate how financial intermediaries can overcome those challenges by adapting their products to the needs of the SMEs to capture this niche in the market. Please note that in this course, we use the term SME for small and medium-sized enterprises, including micro-enterprises. In economic literature, you can also sometimes encounter the term MSME, standing for micro, small, and medium enterprises. But that term denotes essentially the same thing. To avoid confusion, we will stick to the term SME in everything that follows. Well, now that the roadmap is clear, let's get started. I hope you will enjoy this module of the course, and I'm sure you will do great at the end. The gap in financial development between advanced economies and emerging markets differs across the various dimensions of financial development highlighted in Figure 13. Despite lower depth, the efficiency of emerging market and low-income and developing countries' financial institution is relatively high. Access is low on average across all income groups, making this an area of potential improvement. Looking at individual country, there is variation in financial development within the same income group. Some large emerging markets, such as Brazil and Malaysia, have higher level of financial development than certain advanced economies, such as Greece. Also, several emerging markets, such as Armenia and Tunisia, have lower level of financial development than some low-income and developed country, Mongolia and Bangladesh. Figure 7, which is based on a sample of 128 countries over 1980 to 2013, suggests that financial development increases growth, but the effect weakens at higher level of financial developments and eventually become negative. This relationship confirmed recent findings in the literature Arkan, Berkes, and Panizza 2012. Figure 7 also illustrates where a set of countries at different stages of financial development will lie on the estimated curve. It is worth emphasizing, however, that there is a wide band around the turning point. 
reflecting variation in country fundamentals and institutional setting. With a confidence level of 95%, the point at which the marginal impact of finance on growth becomes significantly negative is around 0.7. When it comes to financial development and economic stability, the data show that the relationship is also nonlinear. This finding is in line with recent studies. Financial development initially lowered growth volatility as it allowed for an expansion of opportunity for effective risk management and diversification. After a certain point, volatility began to increase again. Interestingly, the turning point on the GDP growth volatility curve is very close to the one on the GDP growth curve in the previous figure seven. This suggests that there is a wide range of financial development levels that promote both economic growth and economic stability. In figure 10, right panel, financial stability is approximated by the Z-score, which measures the amount of buffers the banking system has to guard against shocks to earnings. A lower Z-score means a lower distance to distress that is bigger financial stability risk. With increasing depth of financial institution, buffers tend to decline, all the things being equal.